Congratulations, true crime addicts. We've survived another week. It is Friday, June 23rd, 2023. This week, the Gorge Amphitheater mass shooter blames mushrooms for his killing spree. Hunter Biden gets probation. And the Delphi suspect admits that he did it. All this and more. Stay tuned. Yes. Super excited. We are all pumped to have James Author Renner. James Renner on. That James Renner has zeroed in. James on. Renner's once again drops a bombshell. Bomb Investigative James journalist Renner. reporter James Renner, who's been on the podcast a long time. Hi, the writer, James Renner. All right, here we go. It's Friday. It's summer. We just hit summer on June 21st. The solstice. How did you uh, spend your time? How did you celebrate? I balanced an egg on its head. Uh, somebody told me that works a long time ago. Uh, only on the solstice. I haven't tried it any other day, though, now that I think about it. So maybe it works every day. I don't know. Have you heard this? Maybe it's just an Ohio thing. I digress. Let's get to the top stories. Any defense for Brian Koberger is going to have to explain how his DNA appeared at the crime scene. Court documents filed by prosecutors this week claim that Koberger is a statistical match for DNA that was found on a discarded knife sheath found in the house where four college students were killed last November, according to CNN. The science behind DNA, this DNA match, by the way, suggests that there is a 1 in 5.37 octillion chance that the DNA came from anyone other than Koberger. To which Koberger replied, so you're telling me there's a chance. I'm kidding, I added that part. Koberger uh, was a creep. Uh, I'm sure you, if you follow True Crime, you know the story, but let me, let me get that real quick. Koberger was this creep who was fascinated by serial killers and it appears he wanted to become one Bad luck for Koberger, though. His murders are technically a spree killing and not serial in any way. He currently faces four counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Kaylee Guncalvis, Madison Mogan, Zena Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. This is shaping up to be a very short trial for Koberger. I don't know how you get around that. I guess his best defense at this point is insanity, um, but there's a heck of a lot of meticulous planning and destruction of evidence that went on for this crime. So, yeah, I don't, uh, I wouldn't be betting on him. Another week in America, another mass shooting, this time in Washington State. On Saturday, 26-year-old James Kelly allegedly fired into a crowd at a campground next to the Beyond Wonderland e Electronic Dance Music Festival according to the Kitsap Sun. Shot dead were Brandy Escamilla and Jocelyn Ruiz. Ruiz, sorry. Uh, that was a young couple from Seattle who were actually engaged to be married soon. The Seattle Times provides a sequence of events for the shooting. You can find the whole article in the liner notes of this podcast. James Kelly, the suspect, had taken his 20-year-old girlfriend to the festival that night. Suddenly, he grabbed a handgun from their truck, loaded a magazine, and began firing indiscriminately. At some point, his girlfriend called 911 and told the dispatcher he had a gun, but then he took the phone away from her and shot her too. She survived. A detective with the Moses Lake Police Department arrived at about that time and fired at Kelly, wounding him. He was then taken into custody. James Kelly, by the way, is a joint fire support specialist assigned to the 75th Ranger Regiment. He's in the Army. He had joined the Army in 2021. So why, why did he do all this? We're still trying to unpack that. But Kelly, in some of these court documents uh, filed, well, I guess not in court, but some of these documents filed by police in these police reports, it's alleged that he ate a bunch of psychedelic mushrooms and had a very bad trip. According to these documents, after eating the mushrooms, he began to believe that the world was ending and then grabbed his gun. I am calling shenanigans here, by the way. Maybe the defense will, will, will play that in court, or you know, maybe this could work as a defense in court, blaming the mushrooms, but I've never 
never ever heard of someone becoming homicidal on mushrooms alone. Mushrooms with PCP? That's another story. Mushrooms with something else? Mushrooms alone? You're just going to trip balls and, and think you're seeing the walls melting. You might have a bad trip. I don't know. It seems like a stretch, uh, but that's, that's what's being alleged at this point. Final top story this week, Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden cut a deal with the Justice Department this week to avoid prison, according to the New York Times. On Tuesday, Hunter, the son of President Joe Biden, agreed to plead guilty to two misdemeanor tax charges for not paying his 2017 and 2018 taxes on time. And he enters a diversion program on a gun charge. He'll get strict probation here, but no prison time unless he violates that probation. He owed the government more than $100,000 for each year of those unpaid taxes, but he paid his overdue bill in 2021. The gun charge stems from filling out a government form when he purchased that handgun in 2018. At the time, he said he was not using drugs, but a quick check noted that at the time, his body was about 25% crack cocaine. Um, <coughs> it's pretty obvious he was on drugs at the time, is, is my point. His defense was that his life spiraled out of control after the death of his brother, Bo, in 2015. Conservatives are predictably angry, saying he got a sweetheart deal, but actually this is pretty on point for the charges that he was facing. The Justice Department actually doesn't even waste time, most of the time, on charges as petty as these. If, you li if you've listened to this podcast for any length of time, you, you know, you know I'm a diehard liberal, Marxist in fact, but I happen to agree that the real story here is Hunter's laptop. We've dismissed this. In the media, my liberal friends tend to dismiss this, but I think that is the real story here. I think it should have been investigated a little more. Let me tell you why. What was on that computer? And it's a bunch of embarrassing things, photos of crack pipes and things like that, and, and other, other more alarming things. But what was on that computer opened up the president, the most powerful man in the world, to blackmail in a way that we have not seen with any other sitting president, president at least in my lifetime. So the, it's, it's a legitimate concern, and it doesn't get talked about enough. Um, so as a liberal, I am very much as interested in that. But I think this is the end, and probably for the best. Hunter Biden gets to go away, does his time on probation. We can move on to other things. Um, but I wish it had shake, shaken out a little differently. Those are the top stories this week. It's, I've got a jam-packed show. you got to stick with me after the break. We're going to talk about the Michael Turney case, some fallout that happened this week. Um, R. Kelly's in the news again. And Afro Man. Afro Man was, was, was taken in by the border control. I, you got to hear the story. I'll be back after this break in 2 and 2. Please hang up and try again. And we're back with Future Cop. Starring Ernest Borgnine. All right, on to cold case updates here. Jury selection began Monday for the trial of Michael Turney, who's suspected of murdering his stepdaughter, Alyssa Turney, who went missing in 2001. It's a very big case. If you're into the true crime world, the small world that it is, a lot of people are paying attention to this case. Uh, partly due to the fact that Alyssa's sister rose to fame on TikTok during COVID. And, and everyone is kind of watching to see what happens next. So this is a hard case for the DA, by the way. This is a no-body homicide. They never found Alyssa attorney's body. Now, no-body homicides make up about 0.5% of all criminal cases tried in the United States every year. Very, very rare. But if you can bring it to trial, there's about an 80% chance of conviction in these cases. So this week, um, the other part of the story is this podcast, The Murder Sheet, which is mostly known for breaking news in the Delphi murders case. They, they've been on it since, since the beginning. They're the ones that turned it up these court documents that kind of, in my opinion, got the whole case restarted again. Um, the Murder Sheet this week 
on their podcast featured an interview with Otavia Zapala. Zapala. Um, I'm never going to get that last name right. Uh, but Otavia was the host of Missing Alyssa. That's the Missing Alyssa podcast, which brought this case, Alyssa Turney's case, to national attention. Now, this podcast came out several years ago. Octavia worked closely with Alyssa's sister, Sarah Turney, before they had a falling out in 2019. Sarah then went on to have internet fame herself. Um, nope, but, but what happened to Octavia? She just kind of dropped off the map. Nobody really knew what happened. She all but disappeared. Octavia dropped off social media. She did not produce any additional episodes past 2019, even as the case got more and more attention. Now, here's what happens in the podcast. They interview Octavia. She's been, she's been uh, kind of off the map for a while, like I said. Well, Octavia says she stopped the podcast because she was being harassed by Sarah Turney. And in this podcast, she produces these um, text messages between Sarah and herself that are just a barrage of emotional abuse over texts and comments on social media like that. Almost, almost the type of stuff you'd see in that movie Mean Girls, right? Um, publicly, Sarah professes to be a voice for justice, urging responsibility from the media, and asking others to engage with empathy but Octavia's raw and emotional account shows what really happened behind the scenes. Sarah's, Sarah Turney's harassment of Octavia became so aggressive that Octavia eventually asked the court to intervene and to protect her from Sarah. Many of Sarah's texts were then entered, entered into evidence for a civil court case. During the podcast, Octavia claims Sarah lied in court during her testimony for that case. It's a very serious allegation, but is also backed up by Sarah's own social media posts. If true, if she did lie in court, this could actually damage the case against her father if she is called to testify for that case. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of a big deal, and this is kind of thing that had been talked about behind the scenes in the true crime podcast circles for you know whatever that means, but. Finally, the murder sheet is coming out and talking about this. Octavia has decided that she's going to come out and talk because Sarah, in her opinion, is still harassing her on social media. Um, Sarah Turney has, in my opinion, been enabled by a couple very famous podcasters in the true crime genre, which she's friends with. These are entertainers that run true crime podcasts not journalists. These are strictly entertainers who keep her close so as not to be a target of her social justice campaigns. Um, but very brave of Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee of The Murder Sheet to be the first ones to uh, speak the truth about what's really been going on behind the scenes. I hope Octavia is doing well. I hope she comes back into the podcast sphere and uh, continues to tell her truth. Let's jump over to the Delphi murders. There's, uh, they're all over the place this week. Richard Allen, the suspect in the Delphi murders case, confessed to killing Libby German and Abby Williams uh, a few times since his arrest, according to The Independent. Last week, there was a hearing in Indiana during which both the defense team and the prosecutors revealed that Richard Allen made incriminating admissions in the seven months since he was arrested. Both sides admit, yes, he did admit to these things, but defense is trying to walk that back a little bit. Apparently, there are multiple confessions to multiple people. I don't know how you put that back in Pandora's box. Meanwhile, the defense is trying to get Allen transferred from a state prison to a county jail. They claim he's being treated like, quote, a dog in state prison, uh, end quote, uh, kept shackled all the time, which is causing his mental state to deteriorate. So I guess the defense is, since he wasn't kept in, the, in decent conditions, his mental state is deteriorating, and he's admitting to things he didn't do. I think that's the defense. But he said this to multiple people, apparently. Not 
a good look. Again, that could be another short trial there. Ballistic tests showed that a 40 caliber round found close to the girl's body came from Allen's Sig Sauer handgun. They got him pretty good on that one. Speaking of terrible prison conditions, disgraced singer R. Kelly says he's scared for his life because of the negligence by medical staff at the prison in Chicago where he's serving a 30-year sentence for child pornography, according to MSN. He recently underwent, this is R. Kelly, he underwent an emergency operation to treat blood clots in his leg. It got way out of control. He should have been examined before. Nobody could figure out what was going on. It was a whole mess. Um, here's a quote from R. Kelly. If it was your child, if it was your father, if it was your mother, somebody you loved, you would have said, go to the doctor. We need to get that checked out. We need to look at that. We need to x-ray that. Uh, they treat animals better than that, end quote. No matter what you think of R. Kelly, uh, we, we, this is, this is, there is some sort of argument here about how we treat prisoners. And was it Dostoevsky or Dick Van Patten who said a society should be judged not by how it treats its outstanding citizens, but by how it treats its criminals? Pretty sure that was Dick Van Patten. Um, <laughs> now, I understand that we want punishment. People are, are, are hungry for that. They, they, they desire that in, in America. But there is an argument here that if, in fact, R. Kelly's treatment is or does rise to the, the level of cruel and unusual punishment, that's a decent way to get out of a prison sentence. So maybe if you want them to finish their sentence, you should treat them uh, like a human at the very least. So... Um, I don't know. I'm very interested in that story to see how it plays out. A little weird news this week. Rapper Afro Man was detained Tuesday by the U.S. Border Patrol when he attempted to cross over the Canadian border into New York after officers found marijuana, some Mary Jane, some left-handed cigarettes, some devil's lettuce, some hurricane cucumber. I don't, I don't know. Uh, in his vehicle, according to TMZ. Afro Man claims he gave away all of his weed. This is Afro Man's defense, and I just love it. He says, no, 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 yeah, I gave away all my weed to fans before crossing. But he says he forgot just a little marijuana-infused lotion and some gummies. Um, he was ordered, he was not arrested. Afro Man was ordered to pay a fine, but then he got high. <clears throat> Uh, then, he, then he got high. Like his song? Okay. Uh, over to pop culture this week. Everybody's talking about this new Netflix documentary, um, quasi-documentary. Uh, Take Care of Maya. Here's the write-up. When nine-year-old Maya Kowalski was admitted to John Hopkins All Children's Hospital in 2016, nothing could have prepared her or her family for what they thought they were about to go through. As the medical team tried to understand her rare illness, they began to question the basic truths that bound the Kowalskis together. Suddenly, Maya was in state custody, despite two parents who were desperate to bring their daughter home. The story of the Kowalski family, as told in their own words, will change the way you look at children's health care forever. Now, at the heart of this documentary is a social worker named Kathy Beatty who's been accused of abusing foster children, of going overboard with Maya's case. They alleged at the time that, that Maya was a um, victim of Munchausen's by proxy. They blamed her parents for what was wrong with her, only to find out that, yeah, no, actually she has a medical condition. But this documentary is all about how easy it is, and this is freaking frightening for any parent, how easy it is in the United States to lose custody of your child if you have a um, child welfare worker who takes matters into their own hand. Check it out. On to the book this week. I don't remember talking about this, but we should have. Uh, I want to tell you the uh, book by my buddy Nick Edwards over at True Crime Garage, The Delphi Murders. This is about the Delphi Murders we've mentioned a couple times in this podcast already today. Um, the Delphi Murders, The Quest to Find the Man on the Bridge. Author Nick Edwards, host of the wildly popular True Crime Garage podcast, was fascinated by the case and for years conducted his own extensive research and commentary. 
As such, he was able to dissect the investigation that included an extensive list of possible suspects, such as a hatchet-wielding lunatic, a kidnapper with unusual tattoos, a murderous pastor, a rapist, and a father and son catfishing team. Check out the Delphi Murders by Nick Edwards. And that's the news for this week. I am off next week. I'll see you in two weeks, people. Enjoy the summer. Um, enjoy the beach. Enjoy the pool. What have you. Have some Mai Tais. And uh, it's the weekend, so that's always reason to celebrate. And in the words of the incomparable Murray Saul, the godfather of Cleveland Radio, that means we got to, 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 get down. Damn it. True Crime This Week is a Fearful Symmetry production. Photo and artwork are licensed through Shutterstock. If you like the cut of my jib, I have another podcast you might enjoy called The Philosophy of Crime, in which I attempt to solve the big questions behind our true crime obsession by looking to philosophy for answers. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Sit, Brownie, sit. Good dog.